of it. So during this session, participants will learn from a panel of community members who will share their experiences on pain management and joint health. The panel will discuss pain management techniques, therapies, target joint concerns, family dynamics and communicating pain, lessons learned, and more. And at this time, I would like to introduce our Chief Operating Officer, Don Rodolini. And before I do, Don will briefly introduce our tremendous panelists. And when I say tremendous panelists, I want to say that one more time, and who I'd like to thank again for being here today. And Don, especially, thank you for being here and all your efforts to make this session possible. And with that, I'm officially passing it to you. Woohoo! Oh my gosh, thanks, Nicole, so much. Hey, everybody, I'm Don Rodolini. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of NHF Like. Nicole said, but more importantly, I'm also the daughter of a man who had hemophilia and I'm the mom of a son with hemophilia. So I am also part of the community. It is my great pleasure to be here with our amazing panel, Ronnie, Kaz, and Caleb. Thank you so very much for joining us. Um, I am just gonna dive right in because I really think this is who you wanna hear from. You don't wanna hear from me, you really wanna hear from them. And so I'm just going to ask, let's go to the next slide. And Ronnie, I'm gonna start with you. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself? And unmute yourself. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Thanks, no, that's all right. Okay, uh, how's everybody doing today? I'm Ronnie, um, Ronnie Anderson. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I was born with uh, hemophilia type A, um, factor seven with an inhibitor. Um, I have four kids, four lovely kids. Um, we have numerous of hobbies. Um, we do sports, we do gaming, and uh, we do a lot of, lot of other things. Um, I'm here today trying to bring awareness to the um, bleeding disorder community. And uh, with the help of NHF and Nicole and Don. Thank you so much, Ronnie. And Kaz, I'm going to send, send it right over to you. Next slide, please. Hi, everybody. I'm Cassandra Campos McDonald, I'm always you know, known as Kaz uh, in the community. I am the mother of two sons with severe hemophilia A, both with histories of inhibitors. Um, I also had an older brother who lived only five days and he died from complications at birth from hemophilia. Uh, I am a uh, United Methodist pastor living in New Mexico. Um, the, the other thing that I bring, not just in raising two sons with hemophilia to the panel is that I also live with chronic pain, uh, neck and back pain uh, that is not bleeding disorder related. Uh, so that gives me a little bit of a different uh, perspective in, in helping my son uh, deal with his. So that's me. Thank you so much. Caleb, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Hello, I'm Caleb McDonald. I'm 15 years old uh, with severe hemophilia A with an inhibitor. Um, I'm a sophomore and I, uh, enjoy creative writing, I love to draw, and um, I participate in marching band. Nice. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to talk to you about that a little bit. So what are, what are the, what do you play? Uh, I play the trumpet and I play the synthesizer. Very good. I see that on the, that must be you right there on the field. That is so <laughs> cool. Love it. So Caleb, I'm going to start with you. Um, what do you want to share with us um, about your pain experience? Like, for example, when you go into clinic, um, how do you describe what you're experiencing? How do you communicate what's going on with you? Um, usually, usually when I've had pain episodes, like, um, or, or like was going to have a bleed, um, I would have, I would um, describe my pain as a, as like a buzzing feeling or like knives, mm -hmm. uh, like, or being stabbed by knives, and and like as, as time went by, and I've kind of developed other issues uh, in my joints um, from the aftermath of my bleeds. Uh, it really the that knife feeling that, that I feel kind of just took took on a, a larger form. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, you know, we talked when we first met, you were telling me about how um, you can tell when the weather is going to change. What is that like? On one hand, it's pretty funny. On the, on the other, it's kind of sad. <laughs> so what does it feel like? Is it like a knife stab stabbing or is it a different kind of pain when you can feel that? Just a knife stabbing. Yeah, same. Wow. So when you go into clinic, um, what kinds of questions do they ask you? It's like I'm on a scale of one to ten. How would, how would you rate your pain? Is uh, it's one that I've remembered for the longest time. Yeah. And, and it, <laughs> that number would always fluctuate because either I would doubt how much my pain pain actually did feel like, or how how it actually did feel like, and it was yeah. it was a roller coaster. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure it also depends on what else is going on around you too. You know, pain fluctuates with emotions as well. So that's really interesting. Um, Cassandra, what is your experience with that? You know, you mentioned that it, your pain is unrelated to bleeding disorders, but I think it's important to hear your perspective as well. Um, you know, it's, it's something that you never hope or plan to experience, but when, you know, chronic pain is something that is always with you and, and people don't understand. Uh, it's constant, you know, it's constant. Um, my, my experience with pain is, you know, sometimes debilitating, but most of the time with all of the different therapies that I have to use, I mean, from acupuncture, chiropractor, um, uh, massage therapy, medical marijuana, prescription pain. I mean, there's a million things I have to do just to like look like I do now and I don't look like there's anything wrong with me. Exactly. And that's that's the hard thing. You know, there's this stigma about pain that if you can't see it, that it must not be there. And, and in the bleeding disorder community, we deal with that already because most of the time you don't know someone has a bleeding disorder just by looking at them. But the beauty of it has been that Caleb and I can talk about it and, and I'll ask him, so we're just, you know, watching TV and I'll say, is your knee hurting right now? And he might say, well, no. And then and I'll, and he'll ask me questions and I'll tell him. So, and it's, it's all about trying to describe what that's like, because it's very hard to put words to what pain is. Absolutely. And what are words that you have used? Pulling, um, dull, aching, uh, ripping. I mean, there's just, right now I'm, I'm in the process of, of going to, uh, to a second opinion this coming week because I have an interventional pain specialist I see. And I'm trying to put my head around different words than throbbing, stabbing, knives, right? Because yeah. what does that really mean? And one thing I encourage people that deal with pain uh, to do, because you feel so alone in it, you know, you feel so isolated and alone. I encourage people to read like uh, blogs like The Mighty. TheMighty.com is a phenomenal site that that focuses on so hundreds and hundreds of different uh, disease states and people write about their experiences. And the people that write about chronic pain, sometimes they have these phenomenal uh, ways that they describe. And so right now, because I, I, I do a lot of writing myself and I'm trying to uh, put some more words and more descriptive things because it is such an individualized thing and it is just really hard like I said, hard to put into words and let it, for people to understand. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that perspective sounds like you've actually had a lot of experience or you're working on ways um, of alternative pain treatment, right? And that, and that aside from say, um, you know, prescription pain meds. So that's really, I appreciate you sharing that with us. What is it like as a mom to, I, I love that you shared that you guys can actually speak the same language, which in some ways is heartbreaking, but in other ways it helps you connect. And so that Caleb never feels alone and you never feel alone in that. But how are, what is your perspective as a mom when you see him dealing with it? Well, you know, it's, it's pretty devastating mm -hmm. because I remember I easily go back to those 
years when Caleb was in first and second grade and he was in the hospital more than at home uh, with a knee and an ankle that just wouldn't stop bleeding and an inhibitor that was crazy sky high um, and seeing him just lay there screaming in pain with all the morphine in the world not even touching it and so so you you think about those things and they don't leave your head and it's it's right. just really hard uh, because you want to, as a mom, you want to go in and fix it. You want to find that medicine or that surgical intervention or, and that's not always the answer. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's very disheartening. It, just, it really is. Yeah. I think that, you know, as, as people, we want, we want to fix, but for your child, you really want that fix, right? You just want to take away anything that's bad. So thank you guys both for sharing. Ronnie, how about you? What's your experience with been with pain and, and how do you communicate about it? Oh, you're on mute. It's okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, no um, worries. Experience comes from, um, you know, being, I was born with hemophilia, so this is not something that has just started. Um, Coming up as a child, I always wanted to do uh, most of the things that other kids my age was doing uh, as far as like sports and physical activities. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I did sometimes, but it was always limited. It was always limited. Either uh, my parents wouldn't let me or hemophilia um, and having pain from hem hemophilia would stop me. Um, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's tempting to... Uh, to not be able to do some things, and even as an adult, um, sometimes I don't want to be, you know, bothered or be uh, have any kind of um, doing kind of activities. Mm -hmm. um, but other other than that, it's just um, it's it's very hard um, um, to have joint pain uh, with my knee, my ankle, um, sometimes sometimes my elbows. Um, uh, as far as as far as like uh, interacting with people, that interferes with that also, mm -hmm. um, you know. And some people, some people just don't. Well, a lot of people don't understand because hemophilia is a rare disorder, and um, exactly. you know, a, a lot of a lot of people don't understand how much how much we have to go through in the bleeding disorder community. Um, like you said, we make it look we make it look easy. We try to live live the normal life just like everybody else do, but um. Like I said, sometimes it can, it can get hard. Sometimes it gets very um, tempting. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Totally agree. Um, so you have four kids. How do you keep right. up with their activities? Did you say you have, right, four kids? Yes, yes. Yeah. Four kids, two boys, two girls. How do you keep up with all of their activities? Um, it's, it's, like I say, it's, it's hard, but I always put my best foot forward when it comes to parenthood. I, I, I don't miss a heartbeat. Um, I try to keep my boys um, doing the things that I couldn't do. Um, I try to I try to let them let them let them prosper. Um, do the things that I couldn't do. They're on the football field right now. They play they play a lot of sports. They're very active. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I just try to I just try my best. I just keep my, my best foot forward. I do a lot of. And a, a lot of exercise to to keep me to keep me going. Um, I take my medicine when I need to um, to keep me from hurting um, and to keep me from having a lot of pain when when it's time to interact with those kids. But it's not an easy task. It's not an easy task. I have four active children, so <laughs> it's never it's never life. right right. So it's never um it's never a dull moment. But I, I make I make it happen. I make sure I make it happen. That's amazing, Ronnie. Um, you know, you talked to me before when we chatted about um, some of the ways that that you have dealt with your pain. So of course, there's pain meds when you need them. But you're a big believer in physical therapy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh yes, um, physical therapy helps a lot. Um, if you can get, if you can get your body used to a normal physical therapy schedule, whether it's, whether it's going to see a, um, a specialist or even at home, um, mm -hmm. walking up and down your steps if you have any, or walking around your neighborhood, or, you know, I, sometimes I, 
I have a neighbor, I have a, a park, a neighborhood park. I like to, you know, walk my kid, leave my car park and walk my kids to the park. Um, but if you can get your body used to uh, different activities that you know that you have to do every day, then it kind of takes away from, it kind of takes away from um, spontaneous bleeding um, yeah. and swelling um, within the joints. Um, so physical therapy helps a lot. Of course, you know, we have pain management and, you know, we have to see different doctors for, for pain management. But in most cases, uh, pain management doctors sometimes just see you as another patient. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't know and they don't think you need the medicine more than more than um, some uh, most people. So, physical therapy is a is a is a great option to handle um, pain management. Yeah, and that actually, um, you're you're absolutely right. And and I think Kaz spoke to this about how hemophilia and pain are both invisible often, right? And so right. when you go right. in and you're speaking to a doctor that doesn't have a background in hemophilia or other bleeding disorders. Um, have you had a difficult time having them take you seriously and actually getting the interventions that you need? Oh yes, all the time, all the time. Um, it comes with it comes with having a um, a great background, a great hemophilia team um, that you can have on speed dial. Sometimes, if you if I have to go see a specialist that I've never seen before, mm -hmm. and um, I have to talk to them about my bleeding disorder and the pain um, that it causes and the pain that I go through. Mm -hmm. Like I said, some of, most of most doctors just see you as a regular patient coming in for, you know, something that they don't know about. So I always keep uh, a team on speed dial, someone I can get directly in touch with that can speak on my behalf, um, you know, medically. Uh, yeah. So I won't just be seen as a, just, just be seen as a regular patient. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that so much because I think that's a really good tip for people that if they do have a difficult time, you know, accessing whatever the whatever the prescription is, whether it's for physical therapy or whether it is for pain meds or if it's medical marijuana, whatever that intervention is that your care team, that hemophilia treatment center team really advocates for you. Correct. Yeah, that's awesome. Kaz, how about you and Caleb? Have you had those difficulties in accessing um, interventions for pain? Um, for Caleb, not so much because of the treatment center. And, you know, when you're a patient with an inhibitor, you know the treatment center a lot better than the ones that don't have the inhibitors. <laughs> uh, you know, you're a frequent flyer, if you will. Um, but for me personally, in the beginning, you know, I, oh gosh, how many times I stormed out of an office because I was accused of being a pain pill seeker, you know, and things like that. So, but, but for, but what I have learned, I think is the key if you're not dealing with an HTC, okay, is that you need to make sure you're going to an interventional pain specialist, someone who is going to manage your pain from injections and blocks and epidurals and whatever, as well as the medication. You know, the, the places that say, well, we'll do all of that, but we're not going to do your meds. That's not even worth it. That's just a joke. And so, um, but when you have a treatment center and, and you're working closely with them and they're like, okay, you need to see a pain doctor. Here are the ones. Let's talk about who. It's, it's all about getting your doctors to work together. Mm -hmm. And with Caleb's inhibitor, my gosh, we had not just his treatment center in New Mexico, but we worked with one in Denver. We worked with an allergist in Denver as well. And so, you know, it's like herding cats getting all these physicians to talk together, but that is the, the thing you have to do is you have to advocate for yourself or get someone to help you if you don't feel like you're strong enough or know how, and that's okay. But you yeah. find someone or you do it yourself, you advocate for yourself to say, okay, I need all these doctors to play nice because it's about me. And if you're not the most important person, then I don't know, you know what is, right? You have to be that person. And so when you're doing this for your kids, 
you know, you start with that treatment center, you, you talk about the different things, because there was a point that we even went to a pain clinic through the hospital system, and it was awful. And it's like, no, this isn't going to work. So we had to find some other things. But, um, but you know, the truth is, not everyone is able to advocate the way they need to. And so that's why you keep in touch with your treatment center. You talk to your social worker. You talk to your physician and say, I need help. I don't even have the words. And uh, yeah, that's that to me is key. Yeah, I really think it is too. And I, I appreciate that because I think it takes practice to advocate for yourself. It takes knowing the tone of voice to use to get attention versus I know for me, when I get really frustrated, I get emotional, which I hate. I hate that I can't control that, but I can hear my tone get bad. I can hear my voice raise, I get louder, and then I freaking cry, which I hate, but I can't always control that. So practicing level tone and using the right words and and being able to have that i'd love that you go to your social worker and ask for help with that as well so um that's that's really key um what um i'm gonna go back to you ronnie i'm just just thinking of something as thinking about you with your kids but also your own activities and now you are a dad of kids that are super active you know and they're playing sports and things that you couldn't play when you were young what would be your advice to um, somebody that is younger, like Caleb's age? What would be, and I'm not saying you have to give Caleb advice, but what would be your advice for, for kids with an inhibitor and a bleeding disorder? And then what would be your advice now thinking about this from a parent perspective? Um, the best advice I can give um, to someone growing up with hemophilia is to just listen to the people that knows best. Um, <clears throat> Coming, um, coming up, I didn't, I didn't listen. I mean, I did listen sometimes, but it was hard. My, my, my parents, um, I got in trouble a lot um, for going outside and playing football, trying to, trying, trying to get done before my parents get home from work. Um, so the best advice I can give is, is just listen to the people that knows best. Um, it'll, it'll save you. It'll save you a lot of. Uh, bleeding uh it'll save you a lot of bleeding episodes um and just just the, the people listen to your uh your doctors listen to your your counselors anything like that that, that can um that would that will help with it yeah thank you so going. much um you know kaz i'll circle to you as well what is your advice to parents that might be just kind of starting to deal with this um, or even with a kid that is transitioning. You know, um, I know that we talked about um, Caleb, you know, you when you go in, you know, you're still going together, but Caleb, you're really owning the conversation right now with your clinic um, versus mom answering for you. So, so can you guys both talk about that? And Cass, I'll start with you. And then Caleb, I wanna hear from you too. Um, so yeah, the, the thing, and I'm, I'm talking about before I started experiencing pain, mm -hmm. learning about hemophilia. Oh my gosh, what does this mean? Um, we have to remember, unless we are an affected individual, we have to remember that we will never understand what our kids are experiencing. Right. I will never know probably what it's like for Caleb to have a joint bleed uh, in his knee, unless something weird happens to me. But we have to give the benefit of the doubt, okay? And, and I'll give you an example. See, Caleb's broken his wrist like three times, I think, and there's stories behind all of them, but that's for another day. But, but you know, one time he was there crying, oh, my wrist, my wrist, and my husband and I were like, oh, it's okay, it's nothing, and it ended up being broken, <laughs> you know, and I felt really bad, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh, so, but, you know, we, we try to go, oh, it's okay, toughen up, it's all right, you know, but now I'm not saying go to the opposite and coddle them and just do all of that, but, but, but you know, you have to listen to your kids because they know what's going on in their body uh, way more than we do. And it's, it's a little frustrating, but, uh, and I've always told both of my boys uh, early on, like when they were in elementary, um, if you ever 
fake a bleed to get out of school, you were going to regret it. I mean, they never have. Okay, so you got to play that card and stick to it too. But 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 truly, we just we have to listen to our kids uh, and just you know give them the benefit of the doubt as much as you can. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um, a follow-up question on that before I go to Caleb. How have you dealt with the various um, teachers, the different schools? I know that you guys have moved. So how have you dealt with um, that? And now that Caleb's in high school, how do you deal with not being able to be there for the in-services and all of that? Oh, gosh, it kills me. <laughs> it kills me because, you know, early on, uh, it was really me, my husband sometimes, but mainly me that would go and do the whole, this is hemophilia, blah, blah. If something happens, this is who you call, you know, that kind of thing. And then they get into junior high and it's like, well, you invite them into the meeting and then you let the kids talk about it. And then you get to high school and they don't want anything for you to do with it, right? Yep. So, so it's a matter of, Kayla, make sure you talk to your band director and tell him that you can't do this, that, or the other. And I might follow up with an email. Just wanted to see if you had any questions. You know, it's all about letting go and letting that transition happen. But boy, it's hard. And, and oh gosh, when my oldest son was uh, turned 18 and, my, and the hematologist, Dr. Matthew at the time, kicked me out of the room. I was livid. I was not happy. He's yep. like, Sandra, you've got to go. You know? <laughs> I know. So, so yeah, there, you know, you have to get prepared moms and dads for that. But uh, yeah, so. Thank you. Okay, Caleb, it's your turn. So um, how have you dealt with this? How have you dealt with advocating for yourself, especially at the school level? And we talked a little bit about what clinic is like for you, but how do you do that at school with the various teachers and also the friend groups that you've changed, you know, through your years? For, for, for a while, like since, since I've like had to move, sometimes I, I, I didn't really like having to talk about it. Mostly because I was getting getting like frustrated with having to like tell everyone about it like all the time over and over. <laughs> yeah, because like there there would be days I would be like, oh, or, or or like a, a a cane, and then the next day I wouldn't, and then everyone thought I thought you were crippled, <laughs> and so I have to like explain to them I uh, like all the reasons why I was like that and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, but um. I eventually did did like get get used to it and and I and I was like and that it was honestly kind of fun because like it was interesting just like um, people asking these questions and 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 then being kind of interested in it and and now with like being in high school it um, I, I've just grown so used to it. it's just kind of just daily occurrence and I, yeah. I will add one thing that the frustrating part when we are at a new place that doesn't know his history of the years when he was in a wheelchair and just so sick that they'll see him with a cane. Oh, you're faking. There's nothing wrong with yeah, you. you know? I've heard that before. And so that's it's hard to deal with. And you don't, you can't exactly go back and give the whole history because they really don't care anyway. Right. So that's, that's kind of a yucky thing to deal with. So. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, every once in a while, do you ever just wish you could just whip out factor and go, oh yeah, well, let me just shoot up here and I'll show you what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Just for the shock factor, I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying for the shock factor, like you think I'm faking? Well, guess what? This is what I have to do. Um, yeah. There, so, there were, oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I, when I used to still have a port before I, I moved on to Um yeah. uh, there, there were like days where I had to have to like keep the needle in me um, yeah. and they, like and so when, whenever there were kids who were like doubt, doubting that I had hemophilia, I would, I would just like bring up the shirt and just like and show them. And then you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. But you know what? Sometimes that's how you have to deal with it, right? Um, mm -hmm. I love that you've been really open about it. And I'm sure there are definitely are times in your life where you're just like, I can't believe I have to do this again. But what's advice? what advice would you have for kids that are struggling to really talk about it? Um. Hold on, you got the words. Um, it it won't wouldn't hurt to tell people about it because 
like there there will be people who who will doubt it there there, there always will be people yeah. like through, through all the schools i've been in there there have been but you really do need to talk to people about it because they because they will be um because they will um be more than willing to help you out there there were like um like the, when I like had like uh, incidents where I've been in wheelchairs and canes, there have been yeah. countless kids who have been more than willing to help me out uh, from like getting up ramps, stairs, and uh, carrying things, and yeah. and just kind of keeping that closed off. It's, it kind of just doesn't really help help out that much because there because a lot of kids won't be that aware. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely, that makes total sense. You know, you had said earlier you play two different instruments: a trumpet and a synthesizer. Those are so different. How did you come to play or why have you decided to play two different instruments and when do you play one and not the other? Do you like march on the field with the trumpet in one hand, you got the synthesizer in the other? I mean, <laughs> how does that um, work and why? <laughs> so so I originally, the trumpet was gonna be a French horn, but, but my okay. um, mom, me, uh, a, band, a band teacher recommended me to uh, do the trumpet first, and then I kind of fall in love with that instrument more. Um, so I've, I've been playing that for like since fifth grade, <laughs> so it's been a bit. And um, and then I and then I did piano lessons because I think my my dad introduced me to it, and, and for I've just been learning those two instruments for for a really long time, and and um, and when Marching band. marching band happened. Um, I I was going to try and march, and until I realized I can't march on my leg, because one one day my leg was just swollen, and and I I, I just couldn't. So, and, and since I had um, some history with percussion instruments, thanks to uh, the piano, um, my uh, band teacher gave me the idea of playing the pit, which is just like a, a small spot here where percussion instruments play and yep. don't have to march. Yep. And so I, one year I played the marimba, and um, th this year for my marching com competition, I, I played the synthesizer. And That's very cool. And so, like when I'm out on the field, I'm I'm playing uh, the um, synthesizer, and when I'm up in the stands or uh, doing concert, I'm uh, just playing trumpet. That is awesome. I love. It. So it sounds like you have a pretty good relationship with your band uh, instructor. And mm -hmm. that you could have that open conversation. Are there other teachers that you've been able to do that with? Because I mean, it sounds like they recommended what a perfect fit. And being in the pit, like you said, you don't have to march around. You can literally take care of yourself, which you're doing, but you're also participating, which I love. So are there other teachers that you've been able to have those conversations with? Well, remember, They're probably not on. It's okay. It's a safe space. They're probably not on this. Oh, there's <laughs> Really great experience I had back in elementary school. Um, it was with my PE teacher uh, at the time, and um, and I was in my wheelchair, so I, I couldn't really do much. And, and one day we were uh, supposed to be playing dodgeball, and and that's like a, a big no no for like <laughs> yeah. anyone with hemophilia. But my uh, PE teacher had a stroke of genius, and that stroke of genius was that no one could hit me. And if they did, did hit me, I believe they were reported to the office. Mm -hmm. So I had this huge force field around me. And, I, and on that day specifically, my mom had to uh, pick me up early. <laughs> and and I, I love what she says, because she had multiple heart attacks. She just, just seemed that. <laughs> I am sure. I walked in there and he was in the very middle of the court, balls whizzing all past him. And he was chucking those balls. And, you know, when you have the right faculty and staff yeah. on your side, they will move heaven and earth uh, to take care of your kids. And, and we have been very, very fortunate uh, to have those experiences. That is phenomenal. I am, I can actually picture it. So that's wonderful. Ronnie, I'm going to switch over to you. What kinds of things did you do in school? What were the ways that you communicated with teachers or staff or, or as an adult also, how have you communicated with work? Oh, um, in, in school, uh, back in high school, I did play a little bit of, uh, a little bit of baseball. 
Um, I wanted to do football, but no one was going for that. My family knew it was the, uh, the coaches or anything like that. So um, I played a little baseball and um, basically um, I was just, everybody just helped me stay. Everybody helped me stay cautious. Um, coaches made sure, made sure that I, I got just the right amount of playing time. They knew um, I explained my limitations and they, they agreed to my limitations. Um, so <clears throat> It wasn't it wasn't hard. It wasn't that hard um, managing it uh, in school. As an adult, right now, um, I've I've worked countless of um, ever since high school. I worked countless of um, labor labor jobs. Um, always having to use my joints. Always having to use um, my muscles. And um, I, I've had some. I've had some uh, some managers and coworkers that uh, that. Uh, that that was there for me. Um, that was helping me out um, in certain situations, and um, you know, being that it was being that being that the jobs were, you know, um, UPS. And, um, I was a garbage man for a couple of years. Um, some days, some days I would just be sitting in the office <laughs> for hours and hours at a time. Paperwork man. I, I earned the name of paper boy uh, one time before. So. Uh, some some people some people were there um, to help me out, and it was also, you know, being a UPS for seven years, it was a lot of wow. days I had to I had to take off and you know take care of myself first. And they always they always understood that um, that job specifically, no one no one hesitated to let me take a let me take a day or two off to um, take care of myself um, because I explained the severity of, of my bleeding mm -hmm. disorder. So, um, it's, 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 it was, it was kind of hard to manage, but, um, we always made it work. I always made it work. And I, I worked all the way up until I worked labor and extensive job all the way, all the way up until now when I have, um, a knee replacement um, right. last year. So I, I, I worked literally, I worked all the way to the bone. <laughs> wow. Wow. But it does sound yeah. like you've been able to be open and honest about your bleeding disorder and about the complications. And I love yeah. that because I know, I know that the instinct for many people is to hide it. But then when there is an issue, suddenly that's very hard for other people to understand if you've never really told them about it. So I think that seems like for both of you, right, at different ages and stages in your lives, it sounds like that's really mm -hmm. worked well. So I have to right. ask question um i'm asking this question for nicole <laughs> um so tell me about the pain scale when you go in and you look have have you been given like the smiley face scale do they give that to everybody or is that just for kids um, so ronnie i'll start with you and then and then tell me what is better for you in communicating pain what would what works best for you and if it's a pain scale by the way that's okay <laughs> <laughs> we want to put it down. Yeah, so those those pain scales are still everywhere, um, hospital rooms and clinic rooms. So that is a, a, a good way to um, communicate my pain with people who's um, trying to understand. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I've always been very verbal about um, the bleeding disorder and, and the type of pain I am. I'm, I'm in. Um, I keep it. I keep it, I keep it a hundred. Like I don't, I don't sugarcoat it. If it's, if it's, if it's a 10 and mm -hmm. I feel like it's a 10 and yeah. I will tell you it's a 10, Good. you know, and, and if, it, and if it's not, then I will tell you it's not. But, um, okay. Did, are you the person though, that just walked around for six months with a hip out of place? I'm going to call you out a little bit on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I did. I did. <laughs> So I think I that what, what I'm saying, you have a pain threshold that likely, I think that's part of the issue with the pain scale is that everyone, I think um, you both have said that, Ronnie and Kaz, you've both said that, everyone's pain is individual. And so Ronnie, right. you clearly have a really high pain threshold. So when you say it's yes. a 10, for yes. me, and by the way, I'm a big baby, when I, you say it's a 10, and that would be probably a 100 for me. Right, and I think that's something we always have to keep in mind that everyone's pain threshold is very different. Um, Caleb, how about you? How about you? Have you ever been? You know, here's the scale, Caleb. Would you like to tell us where your pain is? 
Um, how does that work for you? It doesn't really work that well for me. Because <laughs> I, I think I, I do really agree with like some of the stuff you, you've kind of uh, said that that's like very individual. Mm-hmm. And, and like we have our own like thresholds and and just doesn't really communicate that well. Yeah. And I, I always like prefer like a system where we mostly describe what we feel because it could definitely help us get, get to like somewhere somewhere else than, than just from uh, what some graph uh, tells us. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And it sounds like you've figured out what words to use and how to, how do you let them know like where you're at though with, with where, you know, with your pain? I mean, can you go in and just say, look, it's definitely stabbing. Cause I know that's the word you were saying that it's like mm-hmm. stabbing, but it is, it is like how, what, how do you tell them the, the scale or how high it is? Um, mostly just like describe how, how like it, it's affecting me. Like yeah. if I, if it's hard for me to put pressure on my uh, leg or if, it, if I can't move my knee uh, and, and stuff like that. Yeah, that's actually really helpful. Thank you. And you're right. Then that way you're showing not only where your pain's at, but also what it's actually, how it's affecting you in your, in your day-to-day activities, right? Mm-hmm. So then that's, that's really helpful. So guys, we only have four minutes left. This time has flown. I do want to ask uh, each of you, um, what would you like to share with our audience? What is one piece of advice that you would like to give for those who have joined us today? And Kaz, I'm going to start with you. Don't negate someone's pain. If they, you probably won't understand it. Yeah. But listen, and don't just think, oh, they're just overreacting. Because again, you can't see it. It's hard as heck to describe. And, and also, next time you're at the store, and you see somebody get out and they have a handicap placard and you think they don't need that placard. Yes. Don't be judgy because I do the same thing and I try really hard not to because there are days that I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to go into that store. Okay. And I look fine on the outside and the same for Caleb. So don't negate someone's pain. You don't know the battle somebody's dealing with, even if they look completely 100% on the outside. 100%. Thank you so much for that. That's amazing. That's amazing advice for all of us. Um, We don't need to one up each other in our community. We're really family. We're all part of the same community and saying, well, I've got it worse than you. That negates even their whole experience. So thank it's you. It's not a competition. That's not right. A- thank you. Right. Kaz, how about, I mean, uh, Caleb, how about you? Um, I guess it's just know your boundaries and just, and also reach out. Great advice. Absolutely. And Ronnie, how about you? Uh, my advice um, to everyone would be to um, <clears throat> just get involved. Um, get involved with things like this, like these inhibit- inhibitor series um, to, to widen, in, widen the community. Um, the more people that know about it, the more people that are aware, uh, it make life very much easier for people like, like me myself, people like um, Kaz and Caleb also. Um, well, we'll we, if we can get through to more bigger people and doctors um, and people like that to bring awareness to um, our bleeding disorder and, and the community, it'll make things a whole lot easier. So my advice would be to just uh, get involved, um, share as much as possible, Talk about it as much as possible if you can. Um, talk about it to the right people as much as possible if you can. So um, that's 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 the main thing I would I would think to make dealing with hemophilia a lot a lot easier. Absolutely. And thank you so much for that. That's actually perfect. And for all of you guys that are here, you're doing just that. 
right? You're right. helping us to build community. We're helping. And I know it's been tough in the pandemic because we haven't been able to do this face to face. And I know, I think I can speak for all of us saying we miss that so much being yes. able to have those yes. conversations. And I can't wait until we can be together again, but I just want to thank you, um, Kaz and Caleb and Ronnie, so much for sharing your experiences with everyone, because that's actually, this is our way to communicate and connect. And so with your honesty and, and just giving us your time, uh, I, I just am so appreciative. So thank you all. And thanks for those of you who are joining us. And Nicole, I'm going to turn it to you because I think you might have some closing comments. 